and welcome back to Mental Health Matters with Dr. Scott Terry. I'm so, so excited and glad you're back. It's been a little hiatus for me going through so many interesting little things. We just did a wonderful lecture here in Fairfield, Iowa on addiction and suicide and all kinds of little questions and answers about what we can do to make a difference in the lives of ourselves and others. Today, we've got just a fantastic person. Suzanne Stryker is with us today. And you are listening to Mental Health Matters on KRUU-FM 100.1 on your FM dial and the internet everywhere. We broadcast 6.30 on Tuesday nights and rebroadcast uh, 12.30 on Thursday afternoons. And like I said, we archive everything so you could listen to old shows. Co- uh, contact us. You could email us at Scott at um, uh, at mental health matters at KRUUFM dot com. So uh, mental health matters at KRUUFM dot com for any emails, any questions, any thoughts. Today, let me get to our big thing. This is Scott Terry, by the way, and I am a licensed marriage and family therapist, educational psychologist, counselor. I run the Arden Counseling Center, which is throughout all of Illinois and throughout all of Iowa, actually. It's pretty exciting. And we're trying to do things to make a difference in your life today. Suzanne Stryker is with us today, and she is the founder of RevealWisdom.com. Pretty cool site, by the way. And Free Global Health, which she organized to help people around the world. She's somebody trying to make a difference. She assists individuals with all types of challenges, ranging from physical and mental to career and relationships, transforming negatives into positives. And we sure all need that. For information, you could see her at revealwisdom.com, where you will see over 100 testimonials from people uh, in Fairfield, Iowa, and around the world. And she quotes... um, Eva Marie, she said, Suzanne is having a positive influence on others and their experiences, a catalytic effect. We all talk about Maharishi here in a second. And he had various types of research done on her, including her brain waves. It's good that she has a brain. I'm not sure that mine's working so good at the moment. Anyways... One of her areas that she helps people with is changing bad habits, and she will go into a few tips about that area today, which is a great area to think about, because our focus today is really about changing habits. So welcome, Suzanne. Thank you so much, Scott. I really, by the way, enjoyed the the presentation that you and others gave at the Fairfield Library recently about addiction and its relationship to mental health, and suicide. Uh, I think you're doing great service, and I just wanted to thank you and the others that made that possible. Well, thank you. You know, it's it's interesting getting, and we're going to talk about this habit thing, when you're doing what you're supposed to be doing in this life, it doesn't feel like it's effort. It feels like you're just doing what you're supposed to do. It's like if you have kids and you're really attuned to raising those kids— Yes, it's hard work. It's harder probably than anything in the world. But once you're attuned to, okay, this is what I'm doing, and you accept that, then it becomes kind of like there's this flow. And what happens, I think, with habits is we get into that flow sometimes, maybe in a negative way, and we get trapped, or we get in the flow in a positive way with using habits in a way to make our lives better. But how would you talk about it, Suzanne? You're the expert here, and I'm just listening in. Well, I don't consider myself an expert. I think I'm. we're all learning in this area, but I've been thinking about it quite a lot since I was young. I saw people around me with addictive behaviors, and I thought at an early age when I was a kid that I could make a choice, since I probably had addictive genes, that I would either choose good habits or bad habits to be addicted to. Mm. So why don't we actually, everyone listening, let's look through the catalog of our own life and pick one habit that we want to change. 
maybe uh, maybe Scott with with me you can we can think of some different habits out loud that people might want to change. For example, overworking can be a habit you might want to change. Absolutely. It's getting trapped in you know running away in a different kind of way. So yeah. when I think about addictions, you know, I think of it as more than stopping drinking or smoking something that's not working for you or whatever you're doing. But the real habit, the, what's underlying it, what's underlying addiction isn't addicted to drinking or drinking to or addicted to smoking. It's really getting addicted to addiction itself and finding and looking for areas to run away. And so the goal is not to stop drinking or to stop smoking something or to stop taking some pills. The goal is to, that you don't need to run anymore, that the tiger is not in the room chasing you, and that you're finally free to create your future today. And we'll talk about future focus therapy in a later episode, but it's really thinking about taking us ourselves to that bigger level. Yes, and and so... Like you're saying, it may not be an overt addiction like alcohol, drugs, smoking. It could be many people are concerned that, uh, for example, they're having too much screen time, they're on their computers, their smartphones too much, or maybe they want to change their diet. Maybe they have a sugar addiction. I was just reading an article about the epidemic number of people on painkillers. Oh, absolutely. Uh, that's that's a huge problem, and it actually has led to a lot of heroin issues. Yes, exactly, because doctors have been prescribing painkillers that actually are like opium derivatives, and what happens is that people get addicted, like they're on heroin, and then it gets expensive, and then the doctors stop prescribing because they're trying not to pres- prescribe painkillers so much. And and then they go on the street and get some uh, heroin or something. So it, it's it's an epidemic. It may be though for most of the listeners, they just want to, might want to clean up their habits a little bit. And so I want people just to think of some habit, perhaps that creates the most tiredness and dullness in you. And it could be something simple, not so dramatic. And you could see how heroin doesn't start with heroin. It could start with something else. We start running away from our pain and we get addicted to pills and then we get addicted to heroin or whatever it is. But we could, people, all of us are addicts. I think every one of us is an addict and we just don't see it. And sometimes we're just addicted to drama or to stimulation my one of my phrases is in terms of everybody who's ADD, and so many people are who don't even know it. Um, and yes, there are people who are misdiagnosed, a lot of people. But if you're ADD, the addiction is really to stimulation itself. It's not to any type of stimulation. So it could be stimulation or you know food. I mean, my God, it's the hardest addiction of all because we all have to eat. And we get addicted to, but I like it, but I want it, you know? Exactly. And so what we're, in this talk here, what we're trying to do is not make anyone feel bad about any particular habit or routine or overindulgences or lack of exercise or whatever it is you want to change, but we just want to be in a supportive role. And so first, what we're going to cover is what causes addictions, and then three steps I've come up with how to change them. We know that knowledge can be a great purifier, and so just sometimes understanding what creates habits and addictions can help. So how do we get addicted? Well, I'll talk in a very simplistic manner, but there's something called dopamine. It's a chemical in the brain, and it gets us hooked on things. Mm, yes. It teaches our brain what we want, and then it drives us to get it regardless of whether it's good for us. And it does this in two ways. The first way. Well, first we experience something that gives us pleasure. Let's say a delicious cookie. That causes a dopamine surge. Now, some of that dopamine travels to the area of our brain where memories are formed. 
and it creates a memory connecting those cookies with getting that pleasurable feeling, that reward of that pleasurable feeling. Now, for a diabetic or an overweight person, eating a cookie, it's like rewarding a dog with a treat for wetting the floor. It's not good feedback. So the second thing that happens, the second way is not only does this chemical dopamine create memories that connects us with that pleasure and what we did, but it controls the area of the brain responsible for desire, decision-making, and motivation. So that's a triple whammy there. Absolutely. Next time we see a cookie, our brain releases a surge of dopamine that drives us to get more cookies. And when we succeed, our brain produces more dopamine, etching it further into our brain. So the more we do something that's pleasurable or, or rewarding, the more that this dopamine chemical makes sure we do it again. This is exactly how habits form. And it, and it really gets us to the point that really... Um, it, it, it just etches it in further and further. And so what happens is that we have a hard time getting out of that behavior. It, gets, it may get to the point where any time we go near a grocery store or a bakery or drive by a restaurant, our brain will release dopamine and push us to get a cookie. So any behavior that results in a reward or pleasure causes this dopamine surge. It could be some of the things we've talked about, the different habits uh, that we want to change, uh, winning a, a game or a race, uh, orgasm, hitting the jackpot. If you gamble, acing a test, accomplishing something, doing drugs, smoking, drinking. In all cases, dopamine is a motivational factor, and it makes those behaviors become automatic. Mm-hmm. And this is why it's so hard to change, because we're fighting one of the most fundamental systems in the brain that's all about pressure. So it wants to keep repeating those things. Absolutely. But I think what's also interesting, and I think you nailed it even with your start, the, the hardest thing about changing the habits, especially the negative ones, even the positive ones, is this one word, judgment is that we judge ourselves. We're not, you know, or we judge others or we judge the habit as being bad or it's good habit, but we're not doing it right or enough of it or something. And so there's, it's not about even what's going on in the brain. It's what we are doing to ourselves because of it and with that. It's our attitude. It's our attitude. It's the shame, the guilt, the remorse, the judgment. It's how we beat ourselves up. And so I think it's also interesting to talk about not just what's the habit, but how we're approaching looking at that habit to make it useful. Yes, and I, I really like that, Scott, because you can change negatives into positive, and that's what I'm really all about. Mm, yes, absolutely. Uh, just like if you have uh, a hose of water running into your foundation, it's not good for the house. But if you take that hose of water and put it on your garden, then it's nourishing. So it's how you. Uh, it can be how you direct your energy. The energy behind the habit that's bad can be redirected to create a habit that's good. And I'll shortly here tell you three steps how to do that. But overall, basically, it's more complex than just a lack of willpower trying to change your habit. There are a few other reasons uh, behind habits. It can, we can have addictive behavior in our DNA, but that doesn't mean it's written in stone. We can change that. However, it's really good to be aware that stress can bring out the worst. So if you have that propensity to have addictive behavior, try not to get tired because it will make your resistance to temptations more. Uh, some people practice transcendental meditation to reduce stress. Do whatever you can that you find that works to help reduce stress in your life. And, and then that will help you avoid 
problems with greater clarity, you'll be able to dis- discriminate better. A second factor is your upbringing and environment, starting from when you're in the womb. They found that if parents were arguing while you're in the womb, if, and if there was a lack of nurturing or if you have over, had over-controlling parents or had some trust, uh, really traumatic experiences or just very stressful experiences, all that can uh, kind of create a ground for making it harder for you to resist temptations. The part of the brain that allows one to resist temptations is the executive function. It's the attention control network in the prefrontal cortex. I'll give you an example, actually, of, of this. Uh, they did a study of some kids in Jamaica and they had kids where they had two reliable parents, and then they had a group of kids where one of the caretakers was not reliable or even not, wasn't even there. Maybe the father wasn't in the picture at all, was typical. And they gave these kids a choice, these two groups of kids. I'm going to give you $10 now, or in a week, if you can wait, I'll give you $30. Now, the kids that didn't have the parents or caretakers that were reliable chose the $10 now. Why? Because they didn't know if they could rely upon anybody to say what they would do in the future because their experience and their upbringing had been that their caretakers had not been reliable. So to them, a hand in the bird was worth two in the bush. Absolutely. And by the way, I'm cutting in here for a second, you're listening to Mental Health Matters, on KRUU-FM, 100.1 in the FM dial. We broadcast uh, broadcast on Tuesdays at 6.30 p.m. and we broadcast 12.30 in the afternoon and on the Internet everywhere. Today we're talking about habits with Suzanne Stryker. Uh, Wonderful talk, and uh, I'm going to have you repeat the three points again in a minute. But finish the second point. And then tell us the third point, and then we'll review them all, and then I'll make some comments. Okay. Well, I've just been going over some of the reasons uh, why we might have a hard time changing habits, and then I'll go into some steps on how to actually help you. But uh, what can happen is that people that don't have reliable caretakers when they're younger end up choosing immediate gratification rather than being able to see the overall picture. These might be people that spin rather than save or eat the chocolate cake as opposed to really having a healthy meal. Mm. But let's, let's go into how to actually change some bad habits in three steps. Okay, great. And the th- three steps are prepare, focus, and reward. I'll start with step one, prepare. Experts say eliminate anything that activates your obsession. For example, get rid of all the cookies in your house if you want to clean up your cookie monster habit. (laughs) You might get rid of sugar, too. Tell your friends not to offer you desserts. Avoid even driving by places where you would normally get cookies. Avoid the cookie section in the grocery store. What we're trying to do is disable the old pathways in our brain until we get rid of it. They're actually connections in our brain. And And that way we aren't tempted. Absolutely. And what we could do while we're preparing is not just remove the negative, but create a positive. That was my next sentence. (laughs) (laughs) Right in tune. So what you do is you search for an existing healthy pathway, even a tiny weak one, and strengthen it. Uh, so it will make things easier. For example, in the cookie example, instead of just trying not to eat cookie, find something healthy to eat that you like, a piece of fruit, for example, your favorite piece of fruit or something. So you're substituting a good habit with a bad habit. And then that way that will help replace the bad habit. Another thing to do is to make a plan in advance, how you're going to handle it when you are tempted. They've done tests on this, and they found 
that you do much better when you have a plan in advance. I don't know if anyone has heard about the marshmallow experiment or the marshmallow test. Yep. And that's where emotional intelligence of what you're describing in Jamaica came from. Yeah, they they talked, they did uh, some studies there. Yes, exactly. The same fellow studied these kids. What the marshmallow test was is they took four-year-olds and they got, they brought in a tray of different treats and had the kids select their favorite treat. We'll call it a marshmallow. And they said to the four-year-old, you can have this one marshmallow right now, or if you wait until I come back, you can have two. And the child had to sit there with their favorite treat right in front of them. They were supposed to stay still in their, or, or sit in their seat. And they're all by themselves in this room. And then the, the person leaves the room, and they had to wait for 15 minutes, which is forever for a four-year-old with their favorite treat. And I've got a link on my website of a hilarious video, actually. If you go to revealwisdom.com on the bottom of the contact page, it's a hilarious video of these different kids. And as, as soon as the instructor leaves the room, the kid stares at the marshmallow, and some kids start to eat it right away. Some kids look at it, start to put it in their mouth, and then they think, no, I'm going to wait because then I'll get two marshmallows. And, and some of them do some sneaky things like make a little hole in the bottom of the marshmallow and suck out the insides <laughs> Put the, <laughs> the, the shell of the marshmallow back as if there was nothing there. There That's was one great. kid, his favorite treat was Oreos. So he took the Oreos apart, licked out the icing, put them back together again, and put them back on the plate. Some of the kids did some really funny things like, oh, they would put the plate as far away on the table as they could, and then they would start singing to themselves, and they would start, uh, they would, start talking to themselves, and then they would reach over and they would lick their finger and then put it on the marshmallow, it, and then they would make these funny faces, make up songs. They would do anything to distract themselves, which is actually a good thing if you want to avoid a temptation. <laughs> distract yourself, hopefully with a good habit. So the, that's the first step is to prepare. Get away things that are going to activate your obsession. Step two is to focus. Now, this is the hard part, but fortunately, in the beginning it's hard, but then it gets easy. But to successfully change, it requires abnormally intense concentration and repetition. Why? Because we're really working against the evolution. Our brain is designed to conserve energy for really important things like breathing and coordinated motion. And so our brain will revert to habits when given the chance, because they require less energy than change. So, for a while, we still have to force ourselves to do it. Now, research shows that in about two weeks or maybe three, depending, some people are faster or slower, but after a few weeks, our brain starts to produce a protein which it's like miracle growth for the brain. It increases the brain plasticity so that we can think clear and we can focus for longer periods of time. And it actually increases that dopamine, that uh, neurotransmitter. And so that helps, actually, so that we can create this good habit. So the more we do the good habit, let's say, for example, exercise, instead of laying around on the couch watching TV or something, the more reward we get. And the more our dopamine system is activated, making exercise actually have it we uh, actually crave. Another tip is to keep in mind your chosen goal and also some contingency, like if I eat this marshmallow now, I won't get the two later. Or we can visualize vividly consequences if we do or don't. Uh, for example... Uh, I used to have a sugar addiction when I was a kid. And, and what helped me, actually, 
was when I started looking at sugary treats, I would just look at them as dead food. Some people actually take it a step further, and they actually imagine maggots or roaches inside the, the cakes or cookies or whatever it is. You can go, go wild with this and have fun with it, but vividly imagine the consequences if you follow through with your temptation. Wow, that's great. Um, we're, we're, we only have a few minutes left. So um, I love the idea of preparing whatever that means to you. Focus to redirect what you want to put your attention on, as they say, as Marishi says, put what you put your attention on grows strongest. But it really is so true. What we put our attention on, how we focus, what we focus on, but also how we allow ourselves to focus and to take control over our lives really will re determine what we will create. And so the third point is, before we run out of time, is what? Reward. And what does that mean in your life? Well, what that means is, think of your brain as a dog. And Oops. if you want to <laughs> train yourself to have a new habit, you give yourself a treat. That doesn't mean necessarily something to eat. But you need to do it immediately, ideally. And then that will help your brain form a new habit. Absolutely. We're creating new circuits in the brain. And so you're giving yourself a reward. And that reward could simply be, I will close my eyes and breathe for a second. It doesn't have to be, oh, well, now I'm going back to ice cream again or the cookie. It's, it's allowing yourself, the reward is that sense of satisfaction of feeling, ah, I'm in control again. I feel good about who I am. The reward could be whatever you create the reward to be. And it doesn't need to be the same thing. Just anything that's pleasurable. You could give yourself a quick foot massage. You could have uh, some of your favorite herbal tea or uh, read something inspiring. You decide what would be rewarding for you, but do it immediately after you've been a good boy or girl. And then that way, that will help reestablish that habit. Absolutely. It's important to do that. And so uh, sum up again what what uh, the th three habits are, how we got there, and then um, how people could get in touch with you if they want some more information. They could always get in touch with me at mentalhealthmatters at kruufm.com, or you could email my, uh, my personally, scott at ardentcenter.com. Uh, again, I run the Ardent Counseling Center, and you could look me up that way. And I could also then get you in touch with Suzanne. But Suzanne, tell us the, the steps again and how to get in touch with you in our last final seconds here. Well, you can get in touch with me at, through revealwisdom.com on the contact page. It's R-E-V-E-A-L wisdom.com. And uh, there's a contact page there, and you can just contact me through that. In summary, the three steps to change habits are, one, prepare. Two, focus. Three, reward. Prepare means you eliminate what activates your obsession. And then when you're tempted, you focus on what you want. That's the second stage, focus. And then three is reward. Make your reward instant when you've done the behavior that you want. And don't be stingy. Your brain needs them. It makes it easier. Absolutely. All this is not a bunch of bull. It's actually based on biology. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And it was lovely talking to you. And we would really want to talk more soon. So have a great day, everyone. And we'll talk later. Bye.